you walk into your house and the icebox had a place where well, the ice was in the state of melt. And then the rest of us was insulated with cork. They used cork insulation in those days. Eh? And, they, and then, they, they, here was a separate compartment. Over here was a couple of about 20 to 25 miles. And then over here were your trays and everything. Now with that insulation in there on the door and that cork, that kept that cold in there. Now the ice had a little drain tube. And it went to the, the drain tube went down underneath where you put a pan. And you're supposed to empty that pan when it got full of water. Everybody waited till it ran over. And then you emptied the pan. And he came a couple times a week. And it kept, if you really wanted to keep things like hamburgers, things like that, you had to wrap them up so the water wouldn't get out of them and put it up against the ice. But you could keep milk and cream, and it did, it's just a, a fairly satisfactory job. But about 1930, 32, that's when they came with the electric refrigerator. And the first one was a box, and maybe you see pictures of the motor on top. Big round thing, about like this, with vents in it. Have you seen those pictures? Round one. Yeah. yeah. On the top. Who are you looking at? Is that a monument? I think you look at that monument. Yeah. That was the first refrigeration. But those ice boxes, man, it was hard to keep me any length of time. And there was no freezing. Well, how did they make the ice in the first place? Huh? How did they make the ice in the first place? Oh, okay, they how they made the ice. They went in the river in the wintertime. And when they got sick, they would go up there with big saws and they'd cut up all that ice. And then they would take it and they would haul it to a great big warehouse where they had sawdust. And they took the sawdust from the mill, put that ice in there, and then covered it with sawdust. Really? Yeah. Insulated. They insulated it out. And then in the summertime, in July, it was 100. They would go in there and pull that. I saw this as a kid. Pull that sawdust away and there that ice was. That's incredible. Yeah, they did it. Really? Yeah. Ice houses, they call them. You heard of an ice house? Yeah, but I didn't stay that long. Yeah. Oh, sure. They had to have it all summer long. But it was a miserable way. Now, the farmers had basements. And they had basements, and they were cool, and they used to keep their milk and cream down. Or if you had a little creek, yeah, and now we have ice houses. We, and now I'll tell you something about the cars we had in those days. The Model T Ford, oh. they had one problem. Do you know what a cow was on a car? That's right where the windshield is above the motor. That's where the gas tank was. And it was gravity full. And that was fine until you went up the hill. When you went up the hill, the gas couldn't get in, so you backed up a hill. Yeah, right. See, when you went up the hill, it wasn't full. It was full when it was like this. So they had to back up a hill. And I remember my father leaving from uh, Des Moines, Iowa, to go to Minneapolis, Mason City, Iowa, to go to Minneapolis. It was 150 miles. It took us all day. We got up at 4 in the morning. And you all over got, the farmers who had these wagons, they always had a lot of nails in them, and they were gravel roads. And you could never go any place. Tires lasted then 10,000 miles for yeah. a long time. And every, every salesman had a set of beautiful tools to fix the tire. See, in those days, you had an inner tool. So you only got a flat tire. You had to take the wheel. Then you had to put it on the ground. And you had to get that tool on it. So you had to put your tire iron under here, and then, then uh, put one there. And you had to take the tire up the wheel. Right. Just like and a the tube out. Then you had a little tube, about that big around, and on the top it was real rough, like something for cold salt. And then inside you had a tile pack. Oh, and right. you had to take that inner tube and rough it up. Then you had to take that glue and put it on there, and wait until that got a certain dry, dry then you put the pack on. And you packed that tube. They all tired that tube there. Then you pack that tube. Now you got to get that tube back in that tire. And you got to get that tire back on the... You got to get that tire back on the rim. And 
I'll tell you, everybody learned how to change the tire. How did you get air back in? Yeah, oh, then you pumped it up by hand. Yes, yeah, pump. That was a, that was quite a feat. Uh, <laughs> and I remember we would always get a flat tire. At one time, I remember we stopped at a farmhouse to get water. They'd boil over sometimes. And the farmer came out and got enough water for the radiator. And my father gave him a dime tip. Well, that'd be like two dollars a day. And I said, Dad, you didn't have to give me any money. Water is free. He said, for me, you want to get in the car. That's all he said. Get what? Get in the car. He was happy to get the water. <laughs> it was such a trip. It was 150 miles. Took you all day? Well, we leave at 4 in the morning. We get there about 4 in the afternoon. It was a big deal. Well, they only went 30 miles now, but then they were diesel. <laughs> <laughs> and the flat, and the flat tractor. You know, my grandpa says the same thing, or uh, the same thing about it in Carolina, because there was no paved roads, no. and there was one road in particular that had a lot of pine knots from the roof in the road, and he would always get a flat going down that road. Oh, but he'd go and he'd get a flat. And he'd get stuck. He'd get stuck in the mud, yeah, or stuck in the mud, because the tires were thin. Thin earth. You being the youngest, were you in charge of pumping the Oh, no, I was just a young kid, about 10 years old. But, uh, but my father, they all these salesmen, they know how, how to use those tire irons. So how old were you when they got a car that was much better than the business? Well, that's kind of thing. When that all changed. And, oh, well, then when they started, uh, when they started paving the roads and black top. It was better when I was 18 years old. I graduated from high school in 1934. Do you remember when electricity came in? Oh, you already fully it. Did your mother cook on wood stove? No. We, we always had electricity in 1960. I think we had electricity. Are you a glove? Well, we weren't a glove. Yeah, you had a glove. We were the one out. I never remember as a child at home having an outdoor visit. But I remember visiting out in the country with our friends. So we had outdoor children. Yeah. But they but they just picked us up. Well, I'll tell you when they got to uh, to the country it was the RE a rural electrification. That was in about 34, 35 years ago. that. But uh, it was a, even after World War II and 48, there were some farmers up in northern Minnesota that did not have indoor pumps. They did not have electricity. Really? Did, you, know? Huh? you know, you know what's amazing? Those farmers, I remember falling on them at night. They go out there in the morning in the dark and the evening in the dark and look all the cows, straw all over the place, like kindred. And they all had cherokee lamps, and they hung them right up in the public. And you never heard them about them. That old lady O'Leary. Yeah. How people come But these farmers never burned down the barn. Once in a while, I wanted to get a light. Most of them had light in the But when I look back, what a fantasy. And they worked so hard, they get up at 4 in the morning, went out and milked those cows, and got uh, they asked this old woman who had six kids, six or eight kids in North Dakota who had been married 50 years, if they ever thought about the boy. And she looked at him like he's crazy. She said, when you've got six or eight kids, and you get up at four in the morning, and you go out and all milk those cows, and then you come back here, and then you make that and then you either go out in the field and help your husband, or you go out and haul water. They had to haul water to wash their clothes. Come back. Pump. No electricity. Haul the water. Wash the clothes by hand. And they were very self-sustaining. Not as long way away. She said, you go from 4 in the morning to 10 o'clock. You're too tired to fight my She said, you just work together to your city. See, it was an existence for that. They want to make sure that they, and they weren't cool in the summer. 
Now, now they have summer kitchens. You know what that is? Out to the yeah. Uh, in the summertime, it gets so hot, like in the Dakota, it's 90 degrees. Oh, yeah, I just did it. Yeah. What? I they still think that's a good idea to have it now. A summer kitchen was a little, a little yeah. house that you had out, out there where you dip your bacon. on. So you kind of bake bread. And oh, listen, yeah. I would go for hours. When there's a hot 90 degrees in the house with no air conditioning. We used to do that at Murphy's Landing. Did you? Where did I hear of Murphy's Landing? Yeah, well, we lived out there. What was that? Minneapolis, Chocopee. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. When you've never had anything, you don't miss it. When you, how old were you when they got AC? Got, got what? AC air conditioning. Oh, God. Didn't have it in Des Moines, Iowa. And I graduated when I was 17. And we didn't have it oh, then. Boy. I'm trying to think when air conditioning came in. I think it really came in after World War II. Don't you? Yeah, I talked to the lady in Raleigh, and she was the first house. Well, well, they came after the war. Yeah, we yeah. learned so much yeah. after the war. Yeah, yeah. Like 50 something, 40, yeah. 48, 50. See, they tell this story in, in Minnesota. It's supposed to be true. Their vacuum cleaner salesman came out to their farmhouse, and he went out in the yard and he got some powdered manure and he spread it on the floor. And he brought his vacuum in. He said, if I don't vacuum that all, well, there's not one bit of that left. How he... And the problem went over and gave him a great big one of the food. He said, you better start eating white. He said, we don't have any electricity. So <laughs> 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 something back, electric back into it. But uh, when you don't, when you're born or raised like that, you're used to nothing but work. Yeah. Yep. I remember I asked my uh, I asked my my uncle and aunt one time and my mom, what did my grandpa do? And they said, Well, you know, he worked in the field. He worked. Yeah, that's all he did was work. They said the closest he came to recreation was sitting around the kitchen table drinking coffee. Well I'll tell you where they worked. All no. the Here's where their fun came. Every little town had a baseball team. Really? And on Sundays, they had a league. They played the other town. And a lot of the farm kids played on the baseball team. Most of the farm kids, because the only people in town were retired people. Everybody was on the farm. Uh -huh. Oh, sure, the farm home used to be a big boat. Oh, yeah. It is. Three or five percent. Nothing. But they, they, that was a big thing. Fourth of July picnic. Fourth of, this is things like that. Fourth of July picnics and holidays. They go to town. I'll tell you why farmers know one another 20 miles around. Because of auction. See, every time there's an auction, farmers go. Because they buy stuff back and forth. People sell up. Did you know that? All farmers all go to auction. So they know people 20 miles around, 10, 20 miles around. They need an auction. And they're always seeing something they need. And the guy's selling out, you, you can target the auction. Oh, you can pots and pans and knives and, and stuff in the barn, cutters and things for that to happen. And so farmers know each other 20 miles away. To answer your question about the only time they did anything so, oh, dancing was, that was something. On Saturday night they would have dance, square dance. And they would dance, they would go to town and they bond them when they build a barn. See, farmers help each other build a barn. When you were, when you needed a barn, or you're getting started, or you want to build a barn, they came from all over, and they put the thing up in just no time at all. Oh yeah, they would just, they get that barn up, and when a barn is brand new, you always had a barn there. They were nice and clean, and they, they had it up above in the hayloft when the hay came in. And they, barn, there, was, there were some barns, they only used four barns then. But people danced an awful lot back in those days. And the dances they did, you see, back in George Washington days, they did the minuet, and you heard of that. Yeah. And the very grateful dance where they found on all that. And then they came to, uh, to, with a fiddler. Right 
the square dance. Then out of the square dance, they came to the, the standard dances of my day were the fox trot, the walk, and the, the fox trot and the walk. Then they put in the cottage and the folk, depending on where you live. You live in Pennsylvania and parts of Minnesota and the Midwest, in North Dakota, they all did the folk. And those farmers could dance, but that was their entertainment on Saturday night. Now they all went to town on Saturday to get their supplies. And it's something interesting. If you look at these towns on the map from the Midwest, even in the east, they're 15 miles apart. You know why they're 15 miles apart? Where they could go one day. Yeah, and that was far they could go in one day with a horse and a buckboard. And what they did when they went to town over the cold, they put rocks in the snow. Mm -hmm. And they get the rocks red hot. Then they wrap them in a blanket. And they put that in the buckboard for heat. But yeah. they do that with a brick too sometimes? Brick, rock, whatever would hold it. Huh? Do I've heard that too, just to get the heat there. And a horse can only walk four miles an hour or something like that. They don't walk too much. So they would leave in the morning about 8 o'clock, 15 miles, well, they get there about noon. Yeah. And then they do their shopping and they do it trying to get back to four thousand. Mm -hmm. And they tell the story down at Wapiton, North Dakota once, the blizzard of 1890 or something like that. They had a blizzard that was so bad. There was a father and a mother, and I think two or three children. And the blizzard was so bad and it was so cold that the father, with his big coat, had his wife and his kids in front of him and had the coat over them like that. And he had the reins in his hands of the horse like that. And when they found him, they were alive. And he was just like a frozen piece of ice. And he guided those horses in the right direction. The blizzards you can't see. And the wind is blowing in the snow. And he covered that whole family in that front seat. And he had the coat over him like that. And he had big beard. And he, you know, when they found him, the horses were still moving. And they were alive. And he was frozen. Wow. Frozen to death, yeah. They had some terrible blizzards out there. That's the reason they wanted to get home before that. Yeah. So you see, the, the town's wall, the railroad came, the town. Now my father was a traveling salesman, and he used to ride the railroad. And he told me that, that you were, and all the salesmen jumped on a train, then they'd all get off to the next town, or the biggest town they stopped at, see. And sometimes they stopped for water, you know. Or they stopped long enough for the salesmen to rush out, see their customers, get their orders, then they wait for the train. Whoa, whoa, you know, start. They'd all come running back. They all knew each other. They all think God. And he said the story of the dishonesty of people. You've heard of the Pinkerton Agency? Yeah. I'll tell you how that came about. My father said, you're supposed to go down and buy a ticket. And then get on the train and have a ticket. But even today, if you don't get in time to get a ticket, you get on the train. When the conductor comes along, he'll sell you a ticket. Well, there's a thing that first learned, they learned quickly about a thing called splitting fares. Called splitting fares. So when the doctor came along, he said, do you have a ticket? They said, oh, no, I didn't have time to buy a ticket. I'll buy one from you. And then if the fare was four dollars, you'd offer him two. You get this? You'd offer him two. And he'd give you a ticket. You know where the two dollars went? In his pocket. Hmm. Okay. And they were beating the railroad. These conductors were beating the railroad. So that's when they put the Pinkerton Detective Agency came along. And my father said some of those conductors had been there for 35 years up from Pennsylvania. And they got caught pretty fair. It was only a year ago. And they got, he was 10 cases. I took the course, I was with the National Cat Birds Company for a year. And they told me, that parents, Darrell said, the man is like a boiler. And the difference is this, when they design a boiler, you put a, a boiler can stand so much pressure. So you put a relief valve on to keep it from blowing up, and the valve goes, it doesn't go up. 
But a man, when it comes to temptation, is like a brother. He can just stand so much. But you know, we hate God. So I, I, I was, uh, I said it and I found out the average confessor was 32 years old, with a wife and family, well thought of in the community, close to church, and that's the man, for, and he's been at this place of business several years, highly trusted. And, but you see, if you got a poor sister, he will succumb. So a man, we were taught, a man is only as good when it comes to Peter. It's a system under which you work. And I believe that. If you've, got, if, you, if you've got a system that is not conducive to embezzlement, your people will be pretty good. Now, I'll give you a story why with cash register, you understand the principle of a cash register. See, a man comes in, he buys something, you ring it up, at the end of the day, he can't steal that because he has to come for that money. Well, years ago, did you ever hear of the White Castle hamburgers? Yeah. They had little White Castles, and they sold them five cents a piece, six for a quarter. Yeah, Jim, Jim says when we were up there. Who? That a moat. When we were up there, we went to the White Castle. Who did? Jim did. Oh, you did? Where was that? When we went to Minnesota two years ago. Are they, are they still got them there? Yeah. Well, we went to the one on Highway 7 right by Nolan. Oh. Well, anyway, National Cash Register tried to sell them cash register. They said, we don't need it. I got full. Let me show you how we operate. We give that manager these hamburgers, and he makes them into little balls, and he weighs them. And then he gets so many buns, and so many onions, and all that. We have an inventory system that is so good, if he eats one hamburger, we know it. He has got to one. About six months later, they came to the National Cash Register Company came along for the cash registers. Why? Well, what they forgot was that the manager started bringing their own hamburger and their own bun. The first 25 hours they served, they kept. Uh, see, they beat, they beat the system, so they bought cash registers. They bought their own hamburger and their own bun. They got $25. See? And so they would serve the customers, but they bought their own hamburger and buns, and they took that money and kept it. Yeah, that's Just like I remember an elk cub was telling me one time that that these bartenders can't steal from us because we inventory all the liquor. Then they found the bartenders were bringing their own bottle. That was the first bottle they sold. Yeah, but it's interesting about about people. Really. It has been proven that people are only as honest as the system under you. And you know how they catch people? Now, there is a way of beating a cash register. If you go in there and you say, how much is that? It says $7.50. Okay, here's a five, and one, one is two, and here's 50 cents. You take your package. You leave that seven fifty there, and you go out the door. Now, the woman or the person behind that has register says, thank you. Now, they got to put that in and ring it up, don't they? If they're completely honest, they ring the whole 750 up. If they're completely dishonest, they put it in their pocket. Or if they're half honest, they give they put half in their pocket and give you half. That's why you wait for the receipt, right? Huh? That's why you wait for the receipt. And so then they got the receipt. Now, but still they can beat that because you just, you're in a hurry, and here's how they catch them. They have a fellow go in there, and he knows what time it is. Well, it's now what? Noon, they're 11 o'clock. And he walks around, and he knows what he's going to buy, and then he hears the cash directly looks over. And he sees 750 around. Then he sees 2250. Oh, yeah. All that, and he writes that down. Then he goes right up and says, here. This is five bucks, here's my five bucks, thank you very much, doesn't take his receipt, goes out. Okay. Now they do that two or three days in a row with the same clerk at different times. Then at the end of the day, they get the tape. Okay. And they see, they find what that seven system should be. And it's not so. And they do this over a period of time, two or three or four times. Every time they do that, they, could, they prove to that person that that money was taken. 
It wasn't just one of them to understand that. See, they cannot identify what should be wrong. See, they might have two species of doing it at different times. It's detected big. So when they show the person with the tape, they say, look, we've done this for five days now. This person was in here 11 o'clock in the morning. He kept track of these four numbers. Then he came up and gave you the exact same or less, and there should be $21 right there, and all that, and it's all missing. And then every case that they do that, they get a confession. They get a confession. Because you see, they can find that. Just they stop with the pattern, you understand? But why does he watch the amount? So he can find it on the tape. Oh, I see. He's trying to catch the yeah. the oh, yeah. behind the back. What he does, he gets that tape out. This and and they know oh, Tom knew it yeah. about halfway through. I got it. And as soon as they pick up on that tape where those numbers appeared before, right, there should be a number there that isn't. And every, then they do this several days. And when they find out to so that person, they say, oh, look, I got you. you didn't ring this up. You didn't like They're laying a trap. They lay a trap. So they put the money down like, okay, you put it in the yeah, they put the money down, I got go, and so that person is not to, you know, just takes his time and all that. You know, the, uh, the the way they're using now to make sure that they're bringing up everything? What do they do now? At the restaurants, if you don't get a receipt, your meal's free. They have the customer wait there for their receipt. Oh, they've got that now. Yep. Now, when I go cash register, they have the red star, which is this one. They have a sign up there. If you get a red star on your, watch your receipt. If a red star appears, your meal is free. Okay, up to so much. Your purchase, up to so much. And people would stand there. It's like a lot of people do that. But, uh, and still people beat them, but it's, and the fellows who sold those cash register had to do their business at night. They had to get together with the owner of the business at night because if they called them thief catchers, the machine, and they didn't like to work with them. And so they had to, if they saw the cash register salesman coming in during the day, sometimes they'd beat them up or run out of town because the merchant, the clerk didn't want them. You know, it was a surveillance system they weren't used to because, the, you know, you. Nancy, you can lose twenty dollars a day in a restaurant and not even know it. Think what that adds up over ten years. Mm. Does that happen to you like at McDonald's? Huh? That to even like at McDonald's and Burger King? And well, at McDonald's, I, I watch some how they operate. They 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 put everything when you order. They put that in to a machine. Yeah. Go to McDonald's. Once they push it into the machine, they got to put the money in there, or they'd be short. Yeah, but not everybody's doing that. Well, you mean you go to McDonald's? Yeah, when you order a McDonald's now, they say, what do you like? And you say, I like a cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. Well, they say, they punch in one cheeseburger. They do. Right. Yeah, well, once it goes in the machine, they got to put that money in there. But they don't always put the, all the money into it. Well, then they'll be short and be responsible. Be That's what I mean. Well, they feel they're dumb to do that. Well, they still do it. Well, you've got to catch them right away. It's happened. They've, they have looked at the outgoing and the ingoing in a drawer. It happened. One of the people were $100 short in their drawer one day. And well, that's dumb. But you see, if they never ring it up, then they can keep the money. That's why they want to say good night. Good night. You're good boy. You got a hug. You're a good boy. See, they wondered what happened because it was a manager that had that happen to him. He was supposed to, he counted all that. Yeah. To the computer, said what he had. He went to take the money to the bank, and the bank said they were, that he was a hundred dollars short than what he said he had. Are you? Are you tired? Yeah. Okay, nice he gets up early. 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 He
What time? Like now, 530. Oh, you better get the, get the head. I wonder if the master took from me the hay years ago. When they say hit the hay. They were. They all made a feather. Stop. Stop. And then, of course, I've been in a bedroom. What was my favorite thing at 10 years old on camp? Well, I'm even younger. Well, I remember getting up. I got a game once that you used. Well, you had the ring to snap with your fingers of the little cues. It had four pockets in it. It was about this big. Oh, wow. About that way. It had four pockets like a pool table. The carom board. Carom board. It had long rings. Okay. And you had four pockets like a pool table. And you try to snap one ring to hit another ring and knock it in. And I got that for Christmas. And that, that, that just amazed me. I thought that we spent more. You can still buy carom board. That'd be a good thing to get for your boys. You just asked sometime at the, on Christmas about a carom board. So and you can play checkers on it too. It's a board that sits on top of the table. It's about like this. Three foot, three and a half foot, and it has pockets in it like a pool table. And then of course you can play checkers on it. But it has these round rings. And they give you little pool sticks. Or you can just snap it with your fingers, see? And you have one ring there, and you take this ring here, and you snap it here, and then you can make it go in the pocket. Oh, is that shuffleboard? A what? No, no, it's a carom board. Did you have clicking wheels? What? Did you have the clicking wheel where you have the stick and you push the wheel with it? We had we had those things that you would go like this, and it would make a lot of noise. Now this was actually you'd walk along the street, and you'd have this like almost little. You push it with a with a stick. Oh yeah, they steal. They steal the stick. Yeah. Did you, did you have those? Oh, we had hoops that we used to keep going with yes, sticks. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, hoops. Oh yeah. Yeah. We what had other those. kind of games did you have? That's right. Oh, we had tops and marbles. Oh, we played a lot of marbles. And we play marbles for each other four marbles, and you do a ring in the dirt, and you put the marbles in the middle. And then you put them in like this, and then you shoot one marble at the other one to try to knock it out of the ring. Do they still do that? Do they? Yeah. We have tops, too. I can spin a top. And then over at the, the Duncan Yo-Yo people made all the yo-yos for the whole United States, the whole world, little town of Wisconsin. And uh, Duncan Yo-Yos, you know where the yo-yo is? Yeah. Wood and yo-yos. Yeah, we had those. They were made right near Minneapolis. Did you get a lot of, like, um, homemade gifts, or did you get a lot of store-bought gifts? Well, in my case, it's mostly store-bought. The homemade gift came from the farm. Were you, was your family pretty well to do? Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time, but I found out that, uh, at the time, he made big money. He lost $20,000 in the stock market. $20,000? That'd be like $400,000 a day. Who did? My father. People on the stock market, but he always made good money. We lived well, but we never owned a house. He always rented. We were afraid he'd get past. During but, the depression, did you think he still do Oh yeah. During the depression, he told me he never made less than thirteen thousand a year, and then he made twenty-two thousand one year. That's a lot. So twenty that. times things are twenty times higher now. That means he'd make four hundred thousand. But he still he sold wholesale roofing to lumber. Now, they didn't have station wagons, they always bought a four-door car and then took the back seat out and put a sample in there. Like you do. And he had a, uh, he used to buy Plymouth and he liked Hudson. He drove quite a few Hudson. You never heard of a Hudson car. Uh, he drove a Hudson car and then he drove Plymouth. Tell, tell me a little bit about your mother. I want to hear about your mother. Well, she was a, I don't think she was highly educated. In those no. days, they never talked about where they was with from high school. But she was, uh, she never drove, my father made, never drove a car. 
and the whole life <coughs> was taking care of her children and going to cooking school. She went to cooking school? Oh, yeah, the electric stove came out, and then they had a lot of cooking schools. See, the people had wood stoves. <laughs> See, they had wood stoves on the farm. Then the people in town had a gas stove. Well, then GE came out with an electric stove. And they had to educate the equipment, because do you, you have electric stove? Have what? Do you have electric yes. stove? Will you ever use the gas stove? I've never had owned one, but oh, I've, I've, you, I've, you know, when I've been at Grandma Joe's or whatever, I've used Well, gas stoves, the real folks yeah. like gas stoves because they're faster and they're easier to control. See, when you got, I never liked the gas stove. But you ever had one, have you? Uh, Did your mom ever use gas stove? Yes, I had one at the, the, the single man's. Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't like it. He didn't like that at all. But the real cooks like them because right, they're quick. They're quick. See, when their family get, they just turn it up and they go fast. And then if it's too hot, they can turn it down. Right. Well, electric, yeah. electric, you can't control it. Yeah. But so they're, to get electric stoves going, they have a lot of cooking stoves. She never drove a car, but my brother was out of work for seven years during the depression. Can you imagine a man being out of work seven years? Seven years? Yeah, couldn't get a job. And I don't think he looked too hard, but he, he drove my mother all over. And she she always took our old clothes up to up to my father's relatives. The Irish up north. They never had much. So she always had my brother take her up there to give the hand down. But so she went to those cooking schools and she loved the cooking. She loved Dutch. And I said, I don't think I think Dutch. No, it's been on but you know, what makes this country great is the development like this. You know, when I speak of the Caucasian race, I'm talking to pure whites, you know. At one time in this country, we had what they call the Wasps. We come back and had the white, yeah. Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, yeah. and yet people in the Northeast. And now, the Caucasian race in this country is really in the minority. It's called the Browning of America. Yeah. And, and you know, I think it's a good thing. I care. I go out there in California where they got a mixture, and those kids that are born here, the Chinese extraction, and the, oh, the Chinese are the smartest ones. Oh, they're smart. And, the and, 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 and you see Chinese kids marrying uh, so-called puppies, you know, white kids, you know? And they're turning out some great kids. The Asians are very smart. Very smart. In fact, How much time is that going to take? Where did they do? Where were they from? They got six on their SAT. I think where they were from. That's tough. You know, you can't score on it. Well, my financial advisor is about 50 years old, Doug Lem. He's Chinese. His mother, father, Chinese. And he's Chinese, but he's born here. And he got a perfect, see, the SAT has two parts, the math. On the math, he got a perfect score. And he's the one that told me about two and a half years ago he put me into a CD for five years and eight years. say how much that's left on the Yeah. And I got a lot of CD for 8%. Well, he got it from an annuity for an insurance company. I like to never pay that much. No, but And I was lucky there. And then he put me, I had to get, I got into an immediate annuity because of Lucy's condition going into a home. So I bought that one at great for 8%. Well, so I got a certain amount of money trying to wreck my life, which is adequate. So I don't worry about the stock market. But he's very bad. Now I have a friend out there named Tsukiyama, and he's Japanese. He was born here, but his wife is from Japan. Yama. And I see a very smart too. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to get ready to start working with the Japanese guy. His name is Matsumoto. Yeah. Well, the do you have, now, would you have money invested in the stock market? No. I'm not in the stock market. Now, the only question you remember of 29 back. Stephen, his father lost how much in the stock market back up? He lost $20,000. That was a lot then, though. I had $400,000. Was that 29 Yeah. In 29 That'd be $400,000. We lost suicide then. Yeah. You know why I'm not in the stock market, didn't I tell you? Uh -oh. I had a grandfather who... He lost his life. <laughs> you have a puzzle kick in your face. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> have you heard this? I don't think I've heard this particular one. Well, anyway, he had half his money in a company that made toilet paper. <laughs> and he had the other half in a company that made revolving doors. 
And when the crash came, it was wiped out for it to turn around. <laughs> wiped out. Yeah, all was over. Yeah. 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 Where did you come up with these? Oh, John tells them to. <laughs> I tell you, the jokes I tell you are called Bogville jokes. Now, you ask about kids. This is interesting. When I was 13, all 13 years old, we had no television. And every Friday night, my mother and father took me to a movie. The movie lasted an hour, an hour and ten minutes. And the theater for gorgeous, and they're all built in the 20s, you know, they were, you see some of these old palace theaters, they were gorgeous, they had the launches up here, it's all the balcony. Well, you, they have sound, do they, in the movies? No, they, they have, they have orchestra fans. Well, you can hear the organ playing in the basement for about two or three minutes. Then slowly you would dry the floor. <laughs> and then you would get, a, then the sound did come in 29. And you'd watch a movie for an hour and ten minutes. Then you had seven acts of opera. And each act lasted seven minutes. And they travel by train. And they always stayed a week in one town. They go to Des Moines, Iowa, and then they go to Minneapolis, and then they go out to Fargo, North Dakota, on to Seattle, and all that. They travel 39 weeks a year. Now, here's the amazing part about it. They always had a comic team of men. One tall guy, dressed in English sweet, brilliant grammar, never made a mistake, very serious. Straight. And that's the straight man. Then they had the short guy. Oh, yeah. The neighbors next to us were the Hagans. Yeah. That's just kind of a social climber. He had a good job. Of, yeah. He had a good job down at Hagan. He was a buyer. Mm -hmm. And he was a nice guy. But they had a, they had a boy they protected. And so I, I built a tree house for the kids helping. And then I made a rope ladder. I didn't realize how hard it is to get up with it. <laughs> it wasn't a sign anchor with the body. Have you ever tried to climb a rope ladder? <laughs> yeah, all oh, it's hard to climb. Okay. Well, the kids are just wild about this tree house. Oh. Now, they had a little boy that they okay. sell the next door. And he came over, and he would climb, as kids love to climb a rope ladder. Kids are stronger as than you think. You know, when kids, they take care of themselves. They don't fall too easily as a kid. And they just love to climb that little rope ladder because it was very hard to do because it wasn't anything. Mm -hmm. they get up to the Well, she just had a fit. <laughs> she just had a fit and wouldn't let them come <laughs> over there and not to turn me in for what a dangerous thing it was and all that. <laughs> the, only, the only time I ever came close to wanting to kill a woman <laughs> was one time about Halloween when it's real dark and I came home and we couldn't find Connie so your mother sent Nancy over to Mrs. Hagen, who had a payroll in the basement, a rec room, they were Connie. And I said, go over, I think Connie's over to Hagen, your mother said, go over and get her home for supper. You got doctor. And, and you went over, and Mrs. Hagen said, she's not here. So when Nancy came back, she was just a little guy, came back and told your mother and me that she wasn't there, so your mother told me, and she said, well, I'm sure that she's over there. Well, she said she's not there. Well, we got worried. So I started looking around the house and went to all the neighbors. And we even called the police. Because you know what a thought that is to have a child missing in the fall when it's done. I never had a more sinking feeling than that. And I didn't know what to do. I called all the neighbors and all the friends and everything. How old was she probably? Oh, I don't know, seven, eight years old, just a little tight, you know. And your mom would have been ten, maybe? Yeah. And Nancy yeah. got over there, and Nancy didn't want and Nancy came yeah. back, and Mr. Yeah. Hagen said she's not here. Well, finally, I, I, I was beside myself, so I went over there after about an hour. Uh -huh. At about an hour, it seemed like ten hours, and I said, we've looked all over for time. Well, she, she's down in the basement playing with my daughter. I said, well, Nancy was over here and said that she told her she wasn't here. Well, she, I told her that because I didn't want any more children. Uh, and I looked at her. I said, you know what you put me through? I'm missing a town. It's dark. 
and I have called the priest, and I've called all her friends, and I've driven around the block because you told my daughter she wasn't here, and I assumed she was missing. What the hell's the matter with you? She slammed the door or something like that. That's a, can you imagine a woman doing that? Because she said she didn't want any, didn't want any more children. See, she, the lying never pays. Lying never pays. She lies. And we found that she didn't think much of it because kids at that age don't think much of that. But if you if you lived in town and you had a child that was missing, you had a thinking feeling. And that idiot woman lied to Nancy and said she's not here because I didn't want any more children. She was a self-centered. Do you remember that? No, 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 that incident. I remember the people. Yeah. I remember that she was a little different, wasn't she? The, uh, the tape went off, but start to tell now, what were you saying about with Tommy? Yeah, the freak. The what? The, the freak. Oh. you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I didn't know what the freak was. And he said, occasionally a child will come, he first. And he said, what we do, we go up there and we start the one leg this way, you know, get it going, and then start the other leg. And we can deliver them. But he said, you have to be very, very careful in what you do it. And not not every doctor can do it. I don't think a midwife would attempt that. They know how to do it. So they do the doctors it. don't know how to do it anymore with the midwife. The doctors the have stopped being trained in that. They have. Now, now because of C-sections, they don't even train doctors in that anymore. Oh. So you're really almost, there, there's very few. You have to really look hard. Well, what do they do when they realize yeah. it's a breach? Do they do a C-section? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. They do. They do. They do. Well, anyway, they deliver them. They do. 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 They not Genesis. What? They turn around. Yeah, see, three of my four children have been reached. Well, that's what he did. He said he turned around. But he said, he tried. if I'm not to mention, I think he says, maybe, I don't remember. It was, I know she it was, was a breach. She was born breach, so because Grandma Jack told me. Yeah. So I know that, that, that they said how he did end up being born breach. See, three, three. They, they delivered her backwards? Yeah. And I asked... Well, I think they, could, they must cut them out of that. She, I asked if it was harder, and she said she had a, a caudal or a spinal or something. Oh, that was the thing. I remember that because... Were you there when... No, they, they didn't allow them. They didn't allow you in no, there? No, no. Were you at the hospital, though? Yeah. Oh, you were sure. able to at the hospital? Yeah. I was waiting. But the caudal came in about that time, and Jackie had her first child without a caudal. Without one? Without it. And then the second one she had with a caudal. That's what they give you a shot in the lower extremity. That's the box that And then her third child she had without the caudal. Because while the caudal works at the time, your back is off for a long time from the time. Really? That's what she told me. Um, that was the case to me. That means that it's you. No, that's a block. They have to. Well, they gave Mom something that wouldn't have been me, and I came out blue. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have another um, memory about Mom? Yeah. So, so what do you think when Dad came into the picture? Huh? What do you think when Dad came into the picture? Well, if I remember correctly at the time, he was going to the University of Minnesota, but he was working in a restaurant. Remember that? You were fast food place in some kind or chicken place. You worked Nelson. at a restaurant. Nelson. Nelson, yeah. You were working at Nelson? Oh. I was working at KSTP. Where? Oh. I, just, I just started KSTP. I think you were at Nelson. Okay. No, no, I remember the no. thing that he worked at a restaurant, and I think it was a fast food place. Maybe you well, it was Nelson. It was Nelson's, but I think you were. No. Oh, yeah, I remember. Did you already quit Nelson? I started, I started at STP in You had already May. started by the time we... In May, in May of that year. Does the name Jack Lester ever ring a bell with you? Okay. You see, Jack Lester didn't want to see him leave. I didn't feel too kindly about when you left Jack Lester. What, what time was that, in Sioux Falls? Sioux Falls. In Sioux Falls when you left that job. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That didn't set too well with him, or me. Because you've only been there about a year, hasn't you? No, I've been there almost three. Was it? 
Did you like the job? Yeah. Yeah, we wanted to get back to Minneapolis. You didn't go back to Minneapolis. Yes, we did. The general manager was a jerk. Where? Santa Cruz. Where? Nelson. The boss. The boss. When did you meet Dad for the first time? When did I meet him? You remember that? Yeah. Did you meet him? Did you? Well, she was still needs the door after that was stopped. After that. Yeah. It was after? Yep. What year was that, Matt? 71. No. 70, it would have been 70 because you got married in 71. Well, I think a lot of this happened. When were Jackie and I divorced? Oh, when I was 16. Huh? I think when I was 16. Yeah. yeah. So that was. Did you meet Jim after the divorce? Oh, yeah. A long time after. Yeah. Oh, Mom, Mom ever do anything when she's real little that she can remember that was beginning to trouble all the time or doing things that. No, she was a perfect child. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't remember anything serious. Will you tell again about your mother coming? Now, Connie was a little different story. Mm -hmm. He got much down. You did? Yeah. I thought he, I thought uh, he was. Connie was a little different story. Connie was right about mm -hmm. Connie was more social than mother, right? Oh, yes. Connie still is more social than mother. <laughs> Nancy uh, spent an awful lot of time with the lady next door. Uh, what's her name? Oh. Yeah. She would come home from school and ride over there. She showed her how to hire her. So you spent a lot of time with her. She was quite a homebody. Did you know that Buddy died? No. Yeah. When did he die? He died. He dropped dead. Um, how long ago? Two years? Oh, it's been a long time. Old grandma's been dead two years. Three okay, years. Three years. Three years. Four years. Three years. How old was he? He was, uh, I was thinking it was after Grandma died. Just like 30 that. something, you know, maybe it was. I was thinking it was after Grandma died. He was 33. Oh, you know what? He died just a year ago. He was just, yeah, he was just a year ago. Did you hear from them, Nancy? Yeah, she called me. No, I called her. I called her when she told me Buddy died. Oh, yeah, but she called me. Every few years she'll call. But what did I have the office? Yeah, Buddy died in Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania. Yeah, he was living in California. 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 And he had straightened way up. He had a beautiful job. He was going back to school. Or had he been in trouble? Yeah, he had he'd been kind of a bum. He hadn't worked, he hadn't done anything. And he uh, finally had moved out, gone to school, and just blossomed. Anyway, he was just walking, he liked to hike. And he was out for a hike. And he just dropped dead and rolled down the hill. So he didn't even find him for a few days. Was he married? No. He never married? No, he married, he married years ago and then he divorced. Well, he had, oh, he he had really a daughter. Young. He married when he was really young. Whatever happened to that family that lived next to us in St. Park in that little house named the Moors, he died in the father. Yeah, well, they're all dead now. I mean, the boys aren't. But no, but well, what happened to them? Did they get a divorce? No. He was no. an alcoholic. Yeah, I don't think they did. I think he died. I think he lost his job, yeah. I think he died, and then one of his sons died from a drug overdose. Oh, no. Well, I'll tell you one thing. No. Drinking is bad enough. No, but when you add drugs to it, then people do crazy things. Are you things. talking about, yeah, you're talking about the Moors. You're not talking about the Paulson. You're not talking about the big house. You're talking about the little house. Well, the one with the last house we lived in, the Brownville. You're talking about the Paulson. Then the one next to it. You're talking about the Paulson. Well, the next closest, to it? and then the Paulson moved in, didn't they? Between the closest and us were the Paulson. Yeah. Yeah, that's not the one who's... Yeah. Oh, his father was an alcoholic. Yeah, the one that we... The little house that we lived over there in, uh, in St. Louis Park. Mm -hmm. Across the highway. Yeah. Well, those people were Irish. They were the Moors, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, that was the Moors. That's yeah. the one who's trying to... Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, the old man was an alcoholic. I think he died. Yeah. Yeah, and then her son died. First of all, Peter. What did he die of? Drug overdose. Oh, boy. Grandpa, tell us about um, when, uh, when they took uh, Pat, and, uh, Pat and his mother and Connie out to uh, like the uh, ice house. Oh, the 
all pretty well. And he it's painted it beautifully. And he had, he had an old garage there where he painted that old warehouse. And he had these paintings all over the place. And he had this beautiful painting of a western cowboy with a horse rearing up because of snakes and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I had that up there, and oh. uh, I bought that for $200. Oh, I bought something like that. Cowboy with the, the big painting about the fireplace. Yeah. Oh, now, when yeah. Where did Pat catch that fish? Oh. Oh, he caught that in Acapulco. Really? Yeah. We're down in Mexico. You know what some of my favorite memories are of that place? What? I remember you, we, we go into the fish house, and, oh, that fish house is nice. Oh, and, it did. And we get out our life jackets and our yes. fishing rods. Yeah. The orange stuff, the orange cloth. Yeah, yeah. life okay. jacket. And we get on that pontoon boat with you. Yeah. And you would take us across the lake to the little store. Yes. Yeah. Uh, remember it that? Is. And the big fat woman. And, and she had the worst personality. She was a nice little guy. She was, she was, I don't remember those. Oh, she was, was little. <laughs> oh, she had a rock. And, and we go over there and you get us candy and stuff. Yeah. And, and, and we buy worms. You, you, you tell mom and dad we're going to buy worms. Yeah. Boys didn't tell them what you were going to buy candy worms along with worms. But I want to know something. My father and mom always used cricket. For what? For fish. fish. Many years. 
And when he was young, at his birthday, he'd get money. And he'd buy comic books and gum and stuff like that. So when he was 13 years old, he got a dollar an hour, and they worked long hours, like 10, 12 hours a day. So at the end of the week, he had uh, quite a bit of money coming. And of course, he called that roofing up by hand and run his tennis shoes. He got the roofing on your shoulder with all that weight. When you get those, uh, I don't forget what they call them, when you walk on the ladder. Rungs? Okay. No, they have a name for them. You know, rungs? A uh, rung of a ladder. And they're all reinforced with metal, you know. And the tennis shoes, you know, where they catch you right in here. So at the end of the day, after working 13 hours, you know, and you go in the evening, you have a pop, and you're ready for bed. So when he got paid all this money, I said, well, Pat, are you going to buy a bubble gum and comic books with him? He never smiled. He looked at me and said, Dad, do you have any idea how hard I worked for that money? <laughs> <laughs> it was different when you earned it. Exactly. Well, when he got it for his birthday, exactly. he got 20 bucks for five right. here and five there. We have all this money. He's not going to blow it. Yeah. Bubble gum and comic books, dude. But he was a good worker. And you know the cop, I never told you this, Nancy. The compliment that I got, he worked several years. He got to be, he was in college, 21 or something. Well, he died when he was 20. So just before he died, about six months, my two foremen who've been with me 30 years, they voluntarily came to me and they said, Bob, we like Pat. And if you're going to retire and turn the business over to him, that too does fun. That's a pretty nice compliment. Yeah. That's the young guy, too. But they've been with me 30 years. Is that what Pat wanted to do? Well, he, yeah, he said, you see, he called us on Friday night and said, I'm going to transfer from Bermuda to Moorhead and go to school at Moorhead State. Then when I finish college, I want to go in business with him. And Lucy would get their life that Pat was going to live with us. But she they got along good. And I thought that was a good idea, just out of college, you know, then we just won't turn the business over to him. And he called on a Friday night, and he got killed the next night. Oh. And he had made that decision. Oh, I didn't know that. Didn't you know that? He made that decision. Lucy was so, we had that big house. He said, I decided I want to come to Moorhead and go to Moorhead State and finish my college there, and then I'd like to go on business with you. And I told Lucy that, then I could expand the business. And he knew it pretty well. And then he was killed the following uh, night. And you know, that crazy in Minnesota lowered the drinking age from 21 to 18. Then, he was then they want to put it back up to 21. Now, do you remember when you were told what was your first thought? Well, we were told that he, that not that he was dead. Right. He'd yeah. been in an accident. Who did right. call first? Well, that, that, I think that, 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 And so, my son-in-law, Peter Lana, worked for DuPont. And he drove us over there. And he almost lost his job over because they found out that he had taken a few days off. And they drove me over to the major. Peter drove me over there. And then we found out that he was a, would have been a quadro preacher. And there were no vital signs. She said, there were teachers come along. And the doctor came in and she was very upset. And they explained to me there were no vital signs. The blood pressure, the pulse, the heart, everything. And that he was completely paralyzed from the neck down. And that if they kept him alive, it would be just for a short time with the vegetables, you know. And the doctor was mad they put him on that life support. That there was no chance he'd live. And if there wasn't an outside chance he'd live, he'd just be, he'd just be a vegetable. And uh, I had gone through that with a friend of mine. That they kept him alive four years and went down to 60 pounds and couldn't see him do anything with him. But this, this was the case where they couldn't feed him a diet or anything. It's all, everything was not functioning. So then they pulled the plug and then he passed on. Did Mom, did Mom, Mom, didn't you say he said the flowers or something? He said the flowers? Yes, he didn't go back enough. 
Yeah, everything, nothing. When they say the vital signs, they're talking about the heart, the lungs, the kidney, everything. It wasn't even a case then of, of, you know, he'd be alive for the vegetable. No, he couldn't eat no, yeah, but it's functioned to stop. No, everything was stopped. They, just couldn't, they might have pulled longer two hours. You know, did he break his neck possibly in the same place where Christopher Reeves did? Well, it wasn't a case like that. I mean, it was... Because Christopher Reeves, they said that where he broke his neck, very few people survived it. Oh, okay. That, yeah. you know, that... And the cat was torn about 60 feet, and I think he landed on her head. Didn't have a seatbelt. And the boy with him was sleeping. Just got a little scratch on the back. Farther than our house. Yeah. In the case that he was thrown out of the back of the van. Who was? The other boy. Mom said he was thrown in the back of the van. Oh, in the back end of the van. Yeah, he bounced yeah. down the back end of the van. Was he in the back end? Well, I thought he was up alongside. He killed all No, no, he oh, walked no, away. Oh, no, he had a step. Yeah. He walked away. They found him wandering. You ever hear from him? You know what happened no, to him? No, he's a Japanese boy. Mom heard from him. Oh, did he? Yeah, now I don't, I don't know how many times, I don't know when, but she heard from him. I've got a couple of letters that Pat wrote me. I'm tired of that. And uh, it was, uh, you know, how young people don't get along with their parents. And he was trying to convince me why he was right and I was wrong, or I was wrong, and he was wrong. I cared for him. And I cared for him. Good night, Good night. But he, uh, he was a good kid, but he was affected by the divorce. Divorce hurts all too. Unless they're from peace, unless they're... So who is the closest of all three children to Grandma Jackson? The closest of Grandma Jackson? Would it have been that? Uh, Grandma Jackson wasn't really close to anybody. Am I right here in that answer? Yeah, I don't know. Are you talking about growing up as little or, or as adults? She still had the most of a relationship with her. But, yeah, but which? As little or well, as adults? I, I, I was making the assumption of being little and growing into an adult, having continually... Like, yeah, I don't think anybody really continued. I mean, I think it said a lot that he had decided to go to, to Fargo and, and take over his business. Why does that say a lot? Well, it says a lot because my mom used to tell me that Pat, Pat was going to take care of her for the rest of her life. He, he was going to move in with her and take care of her. You see, and if he wrote him a letter, Call. Oh, he, he called. Oh, call. If he called. Yeah, I remember that distinctly. Yeah, and see, if he called and said he was going to go to Fargo and then go to work with him, that was in Fargo. That wasn't down in Minneapolis. No, he wasn't in Fargo. See? So he died in Bermuda. Yeah. 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 Jackie was kind of hard to get made. Didn't you say, yeah. you know what I mean? She, she, she wasn't a, a heavy one. She wasn't a she didn't, she didn't communicate. She didn't communicate. No, she didn't communicate. Didn't communicate. I don't think, I mean, I, I don't know that any of us were really close. I wasn't. I wasn't. No. You spent all your time over the closest. Yeah. You were, you were closest as an adult. Well, I was closer, as close as I could get to. I mean, as close yeah. as anybody ever got to in the last four years of her life. But that still wasn't very close. Well, she was very affected by her own childhood experience. Uh, wasn't she with her father leaving? Uh, 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 yeah, I think so, don't you? I never knew what happened between Jack Wyatt and Esther. They got a divorce. Well, he left them. He never huh? came back. He dropped them off at Uncle Will's and he never picked them back up. What, what year was this, the Depression? Mm. I don't know. So who took care of them? Do you no. remember Grandma Jake Hawkins? Yeah, they went back to Minneapolis. They got a ride back to Minneapolis, and my great-grandmother took care of my mother and my aunt while their mother went to work. Really? Mm-hmm. And that was Jake Hawkins. Grandma Jaycox. Now, her. Grandma Jaycox divorced her husband. Yeah. That's close. Yeah, and he... He said he was a religious fanatic. Well, anyway, 
It was Austin, Minnesota, I think, where he was a school teacher and a superintendent of schools, and then when he, they named the high school after him. Oh, that was Grandma Jake Austin's husband for high school. So how I did think it was Austin, Minnesota or someplace like that. He used like to write this. letters to people and tell them they were burning up. They didn't repent. Well, I mean, Nancy, let me tell you something about life. There's always two sides to everything. Isn't that true? There's two sides to it. I don't, I don't know anything about him. And Grandma Jacob, all I know is that she divorced him, but they got a divorce. Right. And then after divorce, Jack Wyan. But Jack Wyan and I were good friends. He used to come and visit us. You remember that? Yeah, I guess, you know, when he got older, apparently, yeah. mellowed out a little bit. What was he like now? Well, as I look back, he was a he was a salesman. He was a good one, and he was a quiet alcoholic. He was. Yeah, you see, I know a little about alcoholism now. They didn't know much about it. Then. Were they kind of drinking buddies then? No, no, they weren't buddies. She did not get along with her father, but they she tolerated him. I mean, and he came to see her. Yeah. No. You talking about her mother? No, I'm talking about Jackie. No, I know, but his question. No, I was talking about Esther. Oh, Esther. She a drinker. No, Esther was not a drinker. She was Jack, a gangster, wasn't she? Well, she was in Vaudeville one time. She was in Vaudeville and he was a gangster. A what? In Chicago, a gangster. Who was? Oh, that's a nice friend. Amber Wyatt. No. That's how she met him. He was a gangster in Chicago and she was a flapper. Well, I never knew that. You got a history too. Dad, I've got pictures. I've got pictures. Well, she was a flapper. She, she was, was an actress and she was a flapper. She was in vaudeville and she was... Yeah, I've got I pictures. I that, but he was not a gangster. He was a gangster. I never knew yeah. that, but I know he was an alcoholic because he never bothered anybody. And he worked all day long. And then he'd go to the bar. Yeah, when he was older. See, what you're talking about is when... You were married to mom, yeah, and he was yeah. older. What I'm talking about is before mom was born, when who told you that? Holly and Ma Nan uh, mom, Nancy, we got pictures of them, Grandma. Mom, we got pictures of Grandma Esther. Well, I can believe that she was she was in some kind of vaudeville or something. Yeah, she told me that. yeah. But you, we're just talking a different generation, over. Yeah, but I, but that, as time. I knew Jack, Mary and Jackie was. As I knew Jack, he was a very quiet alcoholic, never bothered anybody. But he would uh, he would drink and drink and drink, and then he'd go to sleep and go to bed early. And I had thought was going to get up to work. Didn't bother anybody. But he was a, he was a, that type of alcoholic. But he held a job down. They liked him very much. We always knew. We always knew that. He's talking about when I was little, mm -hmm. and he would come and visit. And he passed that on the couch. Oh, yeah. sure. Well, Everybody knew he drank. He yeah. drank just drank and drank. It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. There's so much of that in my side of things. Yeah. Oh. It's just, it's just but it was a thing to do with that. Let me tell you something about the concept. When I was going with Jackie, everybody belonged to a dance club. And when he went to visit anybody, everybody had liquor, everybody had cocktails. It was a thing to do, practically everybody. Now there were exceptions. But I'd say 70% of the married couples drank when they had to be broke. They had three or four drinks or more. That's the way it is. Now they don't drink that much anymore. I don't think people drink as much anymore. I don't think like that. Not, not, like that. not socially like... No. Well, Mom and Dad can do. Yeah. So tell me about, um, how did you meet Mom and Jackie? How old were you? Well, I met Jackie, I, I was 30 or something. I was married and I think I was 32. I met Jackie through Judy Jones. Judy Jones was a good friend of Jackie's, and she introduced me to them. She arranged for a date with Jackie. And that's when I met Esther and Grandma Jason. So you were older. Yeah, I was... You uh, were 10 years older than Grandma was. Yeah, I, I no, was, but I she was 22 and I was 30 when we got there. How about that? So were we. Were you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you date her? Well, a couple of years. But let me tell you about, I was divorced about six years and I was up in Fargo. And I said to a, friend, to a Jewish friend of mine, Bruce Lass, 
and he had a hamburger stand before McDonald's came up. He sold 15 cent hamburgers. Bruce Lamb. Bruce Lamb, the Jewish fellow. Oh, he, they called him the king, and he called his place King Leo's, and they had a sign that cost them $10,000. And he was on the south side, and he had a hamburger business. I remember meeting him. Did you? Yes. And he told me, he said, Bob, I sold hamburgers for 17 cents. I break even on that. But he says, I make it on the French side. You get off. You can one potato make it over a French side. <laughs> and he said, we make it on the soft food, which is food today. Oh, it is? Yeah. We can eat out. We don't get drinks. And it's pretty reasonable. Yeah. You get drinks in the Philippines. Yeah. What? He wants to get drinks. So anyway, I said to Bruce one time, I said, do you know any nice girls that go with you? Yeah. He said, I got just the one you want. And he said, her name is Ruthie Brodale, and she works at Shotwell's. And he said, there's several girls down there, but you'll be able to find her. Well, I said, how will I know her? Oh, at the flower shop. He looked at me and said, well, she's a beautiful flower down there. No problem. Just go down there and ask for Lucy. Go there. What's her middle name? Oh, Lucy. I think it was Lucy Ann. And uh, Anna. So I went down there, and I spotted her by the way of Brunette. And uh, what did I... Oh, I said, I have a cousin, and I don't have time to keep the flowers up outside. So we got a picture of flowers. You mean silk flowers? I said, yeah, I'd like to buy plant some of those outside. Then I wouldn't have to take care of them. And she smiled, and she said, sir, I'm afraid that wouldn't work. The sun would bleach them out, and the wind and all that. So I thanked her. And then I went back a day or two later, and I wanted to buy some flowers for my brother. He got suspicious. So I called her then, and I got her husband up at home, and I wanted to know what she to go out. And she said, I can't go out with you. I don't even know you. Well, I said, uh, I said, a friend of mine referred me to you. So what's his name? And Bruce said, don't use my name. Oh, no. <laughs> That's but, a great friend. Yeah. So I, she wouldn't go out with me. So I called Bruce up, and said, she won't go out with me because I can't use your name. Well, just tell her it's Bruce Lang. So when I told her Bruce Lang, she said, oh, I know him real well. And she'd been divorced two years and had never been out. So I asked her to go out for dinner, and we went about 20 miles east of Pauly. Uh, and they had a nightclub there where they served dinners, and they had a little band. And she used to be a professional dancer. And we went over there. She sat so close to that outside door there, that I thought she was going to open. <laughs> well, we got there, and I asked her to dance, and we danced two or three times. When she came back, she sat a little closer. And we just hit it off just the chemistry with them. A very loving person, the chemistry with them. And uh, we went together two years and got married. Stephen, you never met her, did you? Uh, and you know what I that told me? Oh no, she told me, and Lucy didn't lie. Just before he died. Who died? Had. He went to Lucy and he said, I'd like to have you be my mom. No, I want you to marry my mom. That was it. Mm -hmm. That said to her, and she, that made her feel real good, because Lucy never was that. Mm -hmm. When did he say that? Oh, well, before he died, you know. But were you married, you weren't married then? No. Were you married before he died or after he died? Oh, married before he died. Okay. But before we got married, he went to her and said, I'd like you to, uh, marry you. I think you should marry my dad. Please, sir. But uh, that's when I met Peter Lana. You know Peter Lana? Camp cousin. He's a big guy. football player. All-American. I used to think he was a giant. He's 6'4". He's bigger than, he seems to be bigger than Dad, yet he's the same height as Dad. How tall height are you? He's oh, yeah. But he's, even when we were out there in, in, in February, I used to, I still think he's... He well, he worked he's been 29 years with Maybe that's what it is. Really? 29 years. And he was there. They got 150 sales by him throughout the country. And he's been their number one salesman for a bottle for six years. And now they changed the whole setting. Now, so he, was, he was doing $14 million a year selling their product. And the product that he sells from the big cans, you know, dry. The drums cost more than the product. They make a medicine on the money. 
I remember I remember right after Peter started that job, he was up at the lake. They put all those chemicals out there to kill all the weeds on the beach. And kill the trees. Kill the trees. We have poplar trees there. Which are probably a good thing because they get something fair. But it was just getting started to the lake. Yeah. And we and we still talk about it. You don't like to hear that. <laughs> kill all the trees. Kill these two these two big trees. Well, there you go to jail. Did they rebuild the cabin? No, so the people that had it before it burned, they closed in that porch. They have the, that porch they closed in from there. They built a porch. Remember the concrete down below? They built a room up above and spent the delivery room. Mm -hmm. Now they build a house there. Oh, it's gorgeous. Two stories. So they Big, out. two stories, four bedroom house. Year round. Huh. Yeah. They can get house. in and out of there now. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Didn't you I see it? I thought I did well down there for 70,000. Remember how, how long wallpaper did all and put all that strawberry um, motif uh, in the, in the uh, kitchen? Yeah, but that? Lucy didn't like it. Grandpa Bob. It went when Lucy... When was that? In the cabin. Lucy! No, it didn't go... Mom, yes, she did. She did wallpaper. Mm -hmm. Well, Mom, Lucy... I remember it, Mom. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I think that was the cover. Right. And I, you know what it's like? But see, I, that cabin was around a long time before Lucy. But Mom, before Lucy, Lucy they were married. They were married. Oh, we were born. Born. No. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, they were married. Yes, they were married. Yes, they were married. Yes, they were they were married. Yes, 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 but I think after Lucy went, you did it. Oh, I did a lot after Lucy went. I mean, after the cabin. I don't remember a time when Bella Lucy wasn't ever in the picture. And she was all working on the flowers and stuff. And yeah, we had a picture. Yeah, but no, I'm talking about another time. Is it all that the cabin stuff? Oh, I talked to Canales. And I asked well, him why they did it really. Oh, he oh. said they watched it. I sure. yeah, and the buttons mm -hmm. and all that. And mm -hmm. uh, I asked him to bring a sweeper out and move some of those pebbles. I told him you had requested that and you made a great road. Now we just need to get that loose. But I really kind of liked him. I thought he had a nice personality. Mm -hmm. Kind of not real pushy or bossy. Come out, let's the county commission. No, I had, I had met him. What year were you and Lucy married? Yeah, I met him about two weeks ago. Seventy-four. Yeah, see, yeah, I was yeah, I just, Well, see, what I'm thinking about is when I went to the cabin, it was before Lucy. I must have been like 17, 16. Yeah. It was right after the divorce. I think I bought that cabin in 69. Mm-hmm. Oh, would you be? Because I, I went with you, 18. Because I went with you. Well, I was up there in 1970 then. We only had a year. Yeah. I when we first went in there, the, all it was was tile floor. Remember how cold yeah, it was? Yeah, that's where I met oh. you. Oh. Kevin. I don't know. Do you remember Kenny and, was it Kenny and Donna? Hageman, yes. I still see them. I stayed with them. That's what I'm thinking about. Well. When I went back there this summer, I stayed with them. I remember going over to visit them. They're nice At their cabin. Mm -hmm. I can remember that. Oh, but you know, it's all just when I think of that. Their house is still smoky. Uh-huh. Oh, smoke. They smoked a lot. Was it, was oh, everybody smoked in those days. I can remember going up there, and the one thing I remember about that cabin was always saying the chipmunk song. Oh, yeah. Remember oh, you yeah. had put that um, album and chipmunk song. Yeah. Album and chipmunk song. Yeah, you had that record. In the morning, I had a record of Spanish flamingo music <laughs> with the and I played that at 7 in the morning as loud as I could in the all kind of street. <laughs> the Island Guayla or something like yeah. that. Yeah. It was a big office. Yeah. Do you remember when we were going to stay up all night? We were going to stay down on the porch. Yeah. That porch we were going to stay up all night. And Lucy took us in. You guys got all sorts of treats and stuff. We were going to stay up all night. Time. I think we lasted until what? Midnight? Four I, mean, I don't know. But porch on a lake in Minnesota and not getting no, it was a screen in port. Oh. And we got Grandma Lucy supplied us with pots and chips and candy and 
Oh, what a mess. Yeah. That had hey, that big bar down there. Yeah, I had a bar. I had a dancing room and an office. Yeah. That was 3,000 square feet there. I had forgotten about that because the lady that... Two fireplaces, one in the basement, one in the other room. Your office room. had a lot of stuff about the lions. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Did you should come to see my office? Yeah. 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 I'm a medium I got now, I got three bedrooms, and one of them is a den. A mess, papers all over. I'm the only one who knows what. I don't like to file anything away that I can't find. It. So I just <laughs> put it over here, put it over there, and that's how it's made up. I eat everything to the fall and all. And I got a phone in there and a big desk and a lot of pictures. Now, when you were little, did your mom pick up that I don't remember. A little boy, were you? Matt, he always told me Matt. 
He said, I don't usually go to the formation, but our division commander of the 2nd Armored Division, he said, I served with him in the island. All those guys always served in the island. Why? And he said, our, our, this is August of 41. He said, our com division commander, that's about 10,000 men, 2nd Armored Division, is Colonel George Patton. I didn't know who he was. I served with him in the Army. I, want to, I don't go to this formation, but he's speaking today. I didn't have to go at that time. But I thought that was He said, I want you to go because he swears you. So I went there, and that's when I first saw General Patton. The he had his own uniform. He had his own pearl handle pistol. He was about six foot two. And right away, he, I knew he was an eager. I was smart enough to know this guy was wrapped up in he could just be beautiful, and he loved war. And then he got up and he said, now, some of you were in this army for one year. That was me, I said. Volunteers in January, I was going to get out in January. This is August, the 41. Well, he said, there's no way they're going to bring you in this army, spend all that money on you, and train you, and let you go out for a year. And here's where the exact word. And now, this was a terrible thing to say back in his day. He said, I wouldn't be surprised in the next few months that we will be at war with those dirty little yellow jack bastards. And that worked. And we, we were near Columbus, Georgia, for ten. Next day in the Columbus paper, it said, Colonel Patton predicts war with both jack bastards. And that's when they were negotiating with the Japanese. Remember that? Right. See, the Japanese was over here because both uh, wouldn't right. give them the oil. Remember? Meanwhile, they were playing on the back. Yeah, and, and because of the oil, see, he, Churchill had him sending the oil over there, and the Japan wanted the oil. And they called him into Washington, and they rode up one side, down the other, and he had to apologize and all that. Who are you to talk about the war with Japan? That was August of 41, and he out the king in December 7th. And that's when the men I saved him for four more years. Then I never saw, then I got transferred by the 2nd Armored and I went to the 9th Armored Division. And did you know, when I went overseas to the 13th Armored Division, I wound up with them, we were sent up to join his army. I think it was the 3rd Armored. He was then General, General Pat. And the only time I ever heard him speak after that was when we were in Germany. And they called us up and over the battle, one of the greatest things in the It was more coming toward the end of the war. But he told us something that's very strange. He said, it isn't right that two soldiers that have to sit here and sleep in these pump dens out in the open in this dam, in these little towns where these Germans got these nice warm beds. So I want you to go up there with your rifle butt, your carving, and bang on the doors. And when they come to the door, you say, a glass machine. Get out. And you go in, they'll make them double up, and you go in the street for a day. And it kind of makes sense. Did you do it? Sure. And we went in and slept in their beds, and some of the guys moved to the house. And they justified it by the fact that the Germans had been there. He said, all the Germans we met, there wasn't one of them who believed in Hitler. There wasn't one that believed in the war. There wasn't one that believed in the Third Reich. They were all on our side. And we knew very well that six months before that, they were behind Hitler 100%. Yeah. They liked it. But they had feather beds. They were second to the feds. Oh, sure, those Germans, they were behind him 100%. But when we came and the war was getting over and the Germans left, they knew, they were gonna win. They knew that they were going to win. Then they were old, the mayor. The mayor was on our side, and every first thing he did, he went to a small town. He got hold of the mayor, and he arrested him. Are you talking about the Germans or the French? The Germans. The See, German, when the war was the, the over, we people. came in, the Germans retreated. The, the, the German army retreated, leaving the German right. civilians. Right. Yeah. Okay. And when we met them, they were, oh, we never liked Hitler at all. We were always for you. Oh, sure, because they knew they lost the war. But they were all lying. And, but Patton was very blunt. So we, we stayed in their house, slept in their beds. They were, uh, I never, you ever sleep on a feather bed? 
Well, at first you kind of like them because they're kind of long and tall, but there's no support. There's no support. I wouldn't want to hate them. Yeah, yeah, they give too much. But we, we just, if we were passing through the city. But uh, you know what their biggest complaint was? They lived out in the country. And they have food, you know. Farmers have food. They have milk and cream and butter and meat. Well, in Munchen, which is beauty, the big city, they're relatives. You know, they didn't have anything, you know, the bombings and all that, and the food was scarce. So what did they do? They all went out to visit their relatives in the country. And they weren't too welcome. See, don't you like to have either, you know, eight or ten people find them when you during a war and they got no food and <laughs> never see them before, you know. Oh. No, you didn't really know if you got out of the army what you wanted to do. Well, no. Uh, when my father asked me what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. I had worked in, uh, let's see, I worked six years for the International Milling Company. I worked three years in the office, and then I went on the road as a salesman. I was the youngest salesman I ever had. I was 21. Before the army. Before, yeah. I was 21. Full fed salesman. Iron expected. Youngest one they ever had. And that's why I went to my boss. I said, this is no good for the long term. We can be drafted. I said, why don't I join it? And then uh, when I come out of here, he said, we'll take you back. In fact, they had a magazine called The Grit. I should have saved it. They put me on the cover, showing me shaking hands with my boss, and the title was, This is How Our Service Boys Will be Remember When They Come Back. Remember, nobody expects to go on that cover. So I went on that cover, going off to defend my country. Wasn't even a war. I volunteered for the war. Yeah, I volunteered in January of 1941. And then I went back on Fort Bay, Georgia. And uh, maybe it was, yeah, and then I got in, and then I was uh, in Pearl Harbor City. Now that was the first time you'd ever been in the South, right? You'd never yeah. been to Georgia before. No. Did you meet the Southern boys? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I was living in New York. Oh, right. You were coming from in New Jersey. And you know there were big mobs that oh, get lost yeah. in the woods. Yeah, sure, they didn't know there was... Didn't know the way around. Yeah. They're big cities. <laughs> they probably got to do... They used to say, bring on the royal. We have... Some bring on the royal. Say, bring on the royal. And the kids from Mississippi... We had kids from Mississippi that didn't know how to answer each other. Oh, sure. We had kids from Mississippi that I think were there for the war. We had kids from Mississippi that get... <laughs> they get a furlough to go home. For two, three weeks, they go plow. Well, they come back a week early. Because <laughs> the food is bad. <laughs> yeah, they I come back a week it. early. I can believe it. Oh, things are bad. Things aren't too good in Mississippi right now. Oh. No, they're almost last in the nation for education. Everything. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh. This is the poor state of the country. Poor state of the country. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of blacks, right? Yeah, well, there's a lot of blacks in all the countries. It's, it's a, third of the, a third of the population in Mississippi is black. What made you send mom to the school? Well, she can answer that. Well, because she didn't think I could do anything else. I hated it. Let's put it this way. Your mother was not, she didn't make the honor roll in high school. Let's put it that way. She barely got through. He, he. Nancy just barely got through high school. Oh, I hated school. Yeah. Well, you know, mom wasn't, mom wasn't going to tell you about how school was so much. She was going to. Just wait. And you came for a visit. You came for a visit unexpectedly. Oh. And it was the weekend. We weren't going to tell you about it. Where were you living then? In Burnsville. We weren't going to tell you about it. We were going to wait until we had started and had and was doing it well. And then we were going to tell you it about it. It was new then, then. But yeah, so, so then you said you were going to just stay for, you were going to leave or something, and you decided, oh, you said, I'll just wait, and I'll just stay until Monday morning, and I can see the children off of school. Oh, oh, yeah. And uh, Mom had to tell you then that we weren't going to Well, ahead. homeschooling was not really a credit line, you might say then. It was an experiment. Uh, and uh, some states outlawed it. And we didn't know how it was going to come out. Well, I was not a good student. I didn't like it. Yeah, but you learned to homeschool. Yes, I did because I could learn, I could learn the way I learned best. You see, when I was in school, I repeated third grade. I was behind. Yeah. I didn't get the basics, and I was behind. Yeah. So. so 
So you finished high school, right? I finished high school and I did nine months of uh, business college. And then when I was in the service, I went to OCS. Right. Well, that was three months of intense training. Then when I got out of that, later on I went back to Florida in Georgia and I went to advanced officer training. And then I went to Cambridge in Maryland for six weeks, I think, for six weeks for intelligence. I think if you're a smart young man, you can probably do really well in the world. Oh, yeah. Real average or low intelligence. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Oh, yeah, because he could go right into office. What is this? Stephen, you've got to go to work for her, right? What is that? That's a good point. You want to work. But, uh, I think kids today probably have a little better outlook on education. And it can't so much with this computer. Oh, yeah. Education is so different. Today. Well, the biggest thing with education is to teach a child how to love to learn. Uh, what? How to love, how to, to, love learn. to learn. How to learn. Oh, how I think this learn. computer has helped an awful lot because, boy, yeah. can you learn on that? I want those to learn how to type. That's early. I don't I know. Do you know the most valuable thing I could. So how, how come they don't make that mandatory in high school? I don't know. I think it's I don't know. Jonathan knows how to type. Steven, no, what goes on? I tried to learn to type a couple of times and never did get the hang of it, but I I just started typing and I used all the wrong things in it, but I'm a very fast typist. Well, that's okay too. There are people Steven, who type very well who don't do it so-called so properly. Esther knows how to run the computer better than Carol sometimes. Mm -hmm. Did your dad ever have any nicknames for you? You call him Benny Beaver. What? Benny Beaver. Benny Beaver? Yes, I found my guilt because I worked so hard around the house. I did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and he called me Benny Beaver. Huh? You did nothing. No. He was a baby, Stephen. I was a baby. But I always had a job. But I never worked much around the house. Mm -hmm. We rented the house, you know. I don't remember. He can cut the grass. I think he hired somebody. <laughs> So was your dad the kind of guy when something broke, he fixed it? Or he no, no. He always sat tired of that. He said the most mechanical thing he could do was changing our wall of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes he had trouble with that. And it wiped it out. It wiped it out. And I remember one time my mother came to him. We read him. He said, I like to paint the toilet room or the bedroom. She said, you know, I can get the paint. We can do it. Your mother said that? Mm-hmm. This sounds like my wife. And so, he said, I'll do it. I never told you this before. <coughs> but I made a deal with a painter. He said he wouldn't go in the roofing business if I wouldn't go in the painting business. It worked, it worked real well for years. I'm not going to change that. He never did that. He could bank a furnace. You see, back in the old days, uh, you had coal. Just like the reason he could change his hire was he had to. Right. And every man and every woman who had a basement with a coal furnace, they all have that. Right? You learn how to bank a furnace. What they mean by that, man, is before you go to bed at night, you get a whole bunch of coal. Right. And when those coals are red hot, you put acid over them. Right. Or acid over so one burns too fast. Um. And even if you learn how to bank a furnace, I guarantee you the next morning, the fire was out. Yeah, it was cold. There was no way you could do Isn't that right? Or oh, if you were too lucky, there'd be enough cold to get started. But you see, they didn't have four there then. It was all gravity. Right. And, and the dirty, all oh, that. Yeah. It was dirty and that. Everybody had a cold shoot and had that dirty cold in the basement at all. My aunt's just about your age. I think she's 83. But every morning, her job, she was crippled, she had had rickets, and she was also a dwarf, actually. She was very short, and so she couldn't work in the field. So her job was to cook breakfast for everybody. She had to be the first one up, and she would take what they called lighter wood, which was like yellow pine, yeah. like real rosin. She would take pieces of that and start the fire, and 
Oh, oh there's a man was starting a fire. Yeah. So she'd have to start a fire and cook over a wood stove. They go out and work and then come in, you know, at like seven or eight yeah. and come in to eat. Because they'd already been out for two hours. Oh, I know. They go to work at five. They come in yeah, and eat. Them. And she has to cook breakfast. And she's the best cook. And she can cook kind of Is she still alive? Yeah. She's getting up this time. She's going. She's cooking. What time do you want? It was that cool mint. Oh, oh it's stuck in the patio. Yeah, taking out a couple more of those. But, uh, but I thought that he, he read a lot, see. He would come home and he'd be tired. But he, they go to the movies. Although he was, at one time when he didn't travel, when he was in an office, he would he hit Grand Night of the Knights of Columbus. Who was? My father. He bombed the Knights of Columbus, and the Grand Night was number one place. That's like a pleasure. Well, that's what I was saying. But they weren't very much social people. He quit drinking when he was 40 because my mother got tired of the drinking, so she took him to a priest. And the priest made him sign a pledge. And back in those days, <laughs> your word was your father. People were very proud of the fact that they, that the word meant something. So they didn't have AA then or any of these rehab houses. So my the priest talked to him and said it's a problem. And so he signed a pledge that he was going to drink again, and was 40 years old, he quit drinking. Never drank, he never drank again. There isn't another one. So two, two, you'll have two separate no. ones. One of, um, there's a Hershey's bar. Awesome. But he was an honorable man in his neck. So that, uh, that stands out in your mind that your father did with the station. Oh, yeah. He was a man on his work. Yeah, I, uh, Why you don't get to see that? You don't see too much of that today. I tell the story when they had, I guess maybe I told you this, but the story works. We had a little house in St. Louis Park and I had it on the market for 13 dollars It didn't sell, and so when the, off the market, by Connie used to play with a fellow, I think it was Connie, with a little girl, and I knew this fellow, slightly, and he came over and he said, you still got that house for sale? I said, it's off the market. Well, tired of that, about a month or six weeks before, some lady came and said, oh, I just love your house. The church is going to buy mine. What's the price? I said, 13 five. She said, well, when the church buys mine, I'll buy yours. And I said, that's fine. I got about it. Then it came off the market. He came over. It's off the market. Yeah, you want 13 five? But he said, oh, why don't you sell to me for 13 and what go do real estate? I said, that's good. He took cash. And I said, uh, he said, I said, I'll meet you at the bank at 3 o'clock. Fine. And about 2 o'clock, a car pulls up and says, Gal, do you remember me? I said, vaguely. Well, she said, I'm going to eat. I'm going to buy your house if the church bought mine. Well, she said, the church bought my house. You want 13 5 She said, I'll give you. I'll buy it for 13 5 And I said, I just sold it for 13 and that was the end of it. And I tell people about that, and they all say, but you didn't have it in writing. I said, I know that in all contracts, the good or written contracts, if you can prove it. They said, yeah, but you didn't have to go through with that because you didn't have it out of writing. I told that to Dave, the young people, and they said, I'm crazy. Yeah, but his name would have been pleasant. Well, yeah, but I said, we made a deal. I said, I'm not That's saying I mean. for $500, I would not go uh, back on my word. Uh, Five million, I think, twice, <laughs> but not for five hundred dollars. And you know, young people today think that's crazy. They, just, they see that's how they think. That's the reason they have so much trouble now because people don't stand behind their dreams. Then one of the time I had chances to oh, Oak Hill, Wisconsin was all Norwegian. Oh, they stuck together. And I, I room, I ran room with Randy Rosenblum. He had a PhD. And he was going to the chemical. You see, the paper company had a big over in the Foster Valley around three days. They had a big institute for these bright boys in the paper. This kid had a PhD and three of his friends. They had graduated from there and they were working at the local paper mill. They were bright. Jewish. And so he ruled with me and I knew three of his friends. And so the country club was having a hard time, the old fair country club. So they had a special for young people. 
So we're all fine. They took me. They didn't take them. And I said, well, how come you guys didn't get in? And then they found out it's because they were Jewish. And they said, that isn't right. They don't want my friends. They want me. So I said, to go to the devil. Never gave it a thought. Now I feel pretty good about that because back then I took a chance. But that's how it was then. Jews were not very well accepted. No. Back in 1939 uh, and 4. Huh? Back even in America. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. So those are the two things I kind of thought of. That's just the way it's Oh, by the way, there's one Jewish fellow, Sam Bobbins. There was a Jewish girl in town. I can't think of her name. And I went with her for a while. The and Jewish? this girl? Yeah, and we laughed about it. She said, Avery's not your soul. And she was going to Sam, and so then I knew that she was going to be for Sam. So she married Sam. Sam was Jewish, bright, helped run that mill there, and then he went out in Washington someplace, and he was there 25 or 30 years running a great big paper mill. He got no chemistry and all that for that. And they came to Fargo and visited him. And guess what? He retired, and they named the poor. There is a forest back someplace in Washington. Oh, oh God, where get this paper mill was, and they, they, she told me, she said, Bobby, always oh, called me Bobby. She was sitting there having dinner. That's what Lucy called you. Yeah. And she said, she called me Sweet. Okay. But she, yeah, she said, that. they named a forest, a great big forest back there when he was tired of that. Now you got to be pretty good. And that's one of the same guys that said, Knucklehead, for no reason, knucklehead. They both kind of wouldn't join the country club because of So you're too young to remember what it was like to be discriminated against when I was a kid. They discriminated against the Jews. And you know, the reason they did, see, a Jew could not get a job working for anybody. They looked for another Jew. Yeah. So they forced them to come with them. And now I, I read a couple of years ago, and I believe it's true, the Jews now control 75% of the wealth. Well, what's called the man in America? Who's that? Uh, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Oh, yeah. Who's the Jew? Yeah. Yeah. Who's the Jew? Who's the Jew? Who's the Jew? I know a lot of them. I know a lot of them. They're part of that 82 Jewish family. Well, my you best friend. Do you know that, Stephen? I still, this my doctor, Marcusy, is a French Jew. He retired, lived in Boca Raton, Florida, and I talked to him every month. And we've known each other over 60 years. I remember meeting him. Yeah. Doctor. The very first person who ever touched me. What do you mean ever touched me? Doctor who brought me to the world. Oh, what? Shapiro. Yeah. Doctor Shapiro. Did you know a Peter Jennings is not a American citizen? He's Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. He's had about four wives. He doesn't do well with men. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we come a long way in this country when it comes to discrimination. The Chinese were discriminated against. In Des Moines, Iowa, when I went to high school, there were two blonde girls in our class and the most beautiful women I've ever girls I've ever seen in my life. Jewish. And their mother More was blonde. Huh? Well, I'm talking about blonde. These girls are gorgeous, and I'm the high school. More beautiful than Grandma Jackie? Yeah, they look beautiful. Now, their mother was white and blonde, and she was married to a Chinese man, and he was chef at the biggest hotel in the one hour. And during the Depression, he was making 700 a month. That was big money. Big money. Wait a minute. The Chinese man had blonde daughters? He, yeah, he married a blonde girl. He had blonde daughters. Well, I think... He had very recessive genes. <laughs> well, no, so I don't know. No, 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 I, no, no, I, I think she had been divorced and married yet. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, because... Uh, no, no way. No, 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 no. But that was... No, blonde Chinese girl. No. But <laughs> <laughs> he, she was very <laughs> a Chinese chef right. at, at Kirkwood Hotel in Moine Island. They were noted for their food, all the big food came. And did you know that those kids were ostracized? 
because they oh. have uh, they have a Chinese. Yeah, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Chinese got a lot of prejudice against them, especially in San Francisco and California. They had detention camps out there. Oh, yeah, that they, that still occurs right up here in Brenham. <clears throat> there was a Chinese yeah. family that had a that had a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, and I I knew of you know one of my customers. And their son was like first year in high school, and he was he was really picked on and beaten up by the war. When the war came, World War II came, Roosevelt was president. They admitted they rounded off all the Japanese, yeah, and they had friends of mine in Chicago, I mean in, in, in California, when they were 10 years old. They had businesses, they took them off their business, they, they, they had to sell their business for, for nothing. They put them all in camps, detention camps. Yeah, because yeah. even they were born here in the United States, so American citizens, yeah. and they said, yeah, but where it was the past. And I said at the time, that's crazy. What about Milwaukee with well, all the Germans over there? And we got Germans in Milwaukee that were born in Germany, and we didn't want them up. 